Hey everybody, so today we are going to be going over three categories of considerations that you might wanna think about if you are trying to reuse a pre-made knowledge graph, whether that's made by another part of your organization or a vendor, this is a comprehensive list that you might wanna go through and think about if you are making a decision to pursue a knowledge graph farther and if it's gonna be useful for your use case. I also am highlighting a few considerations that are specific to the LLM space because that is a very hot topic right now and I wanna make sure folks are thinking about the LLM perspective if they are assessing a knowledge graph because there's a little bit of uniqueness when it comes to that. All right, and if you are not interested in watching the whole video, there are timestamps down below for the different categories if you wanna skip ahead. Jumping into the first about access and support. So the first is, how do you access this thing? Is it going to be using APIs? What kind of APIs? Uh, is this more of a data dump? Is this something where you need to have kind of like a file transfer kind of thing? What kind of tokens do you need? That kind of access information is something you wanna find out very quickly because that kind of dictates to you how difficult it's going to be to get to the data. Another similar to that is if you're using the graph as a training set, you're gonna to wanna to jump into the composition piece of this video. But if you're using this to actually run queries or analytics or machine learning off of, or maybe you're you know, having your LLM consult the, the graph, you need to know what the latency looks like and make sure that you understand the latency for simple questions and more complex multi-hop questions. The reason you wanna do that is because you wanna use that data point to understand if it's even worth doing graph or if you can do this with you know, your SQL database or vector database or whatever other things that you're using, this is a good comparison point if you're trying to make a decision. Along with that, if you are using it as a service where you are consulting with queries, what is the downtime of the service? Is there, are there downtimes? And if you are a customer and something is happening during a downtime, what are the escalation procedures for this graph? If you're like, ah, something's going on and I'm at high tide uh, of my organization or my use case, or making sure that you can schedule that with whoever owns the data, that's something that you wanna iron out pretty quickly. And if there are service issues, whether it's a downtime issue or you found an error in the data set, um, this is going to be really critical for you to have some kind of procedure, again, to get escalation or to get a response time from their services so that you can get this resolved as quickly as possible within your service level agreements that you have. Time when you are getting a graph for hire or you're using someone else's graph, you need to understand how their core graph will interact with whatever changes or data that you add to it. Most knowledge graphs have to be customized if they're off the shelf uh, to your use case. And this honestly goes for even the open web uh, graphs like Wikidata or something. You need to add your own data into the mix if you are using it. So is that going to be a local copy? How do the changes that you've made on the core graph model that is owned by somebody else how do they respect those changes uh, when the update process happens? And how do you make sure that your data that's proprietary doesn't end up finding its way into their graph <laughs> and the, into their customers, right? Because that would be very bad if you have put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into this data that you own, you've added it to a graph that you thought was just an instance, but actually it's just one giant graph. So make sure you ask about that. Another one that's gonna tie into that you know, LLM use case if you have it, which is how often is this data set updated? What is the update schedule? Do you have a guaranteed amount of updates for the entire graph, for specific domains, or even specific entities and uh, statements, or like triples? Is that something that they support? And if they don't, you really wanna understand what your threshold is of updated data because they're not giving you any, any guarantees. So you need to make sure that you understand what that looks like for you. Another is, does it handle streaming data? So if you are doing real-time analytics or you, know, you have time sensitive things that you have to consult, like if it's a threat detection kind of thing, you need to make sure that you understand if the transactional kind of data is going to be represented or allowed in this graph, or if the graph is kind of like, upstream from that and you have to have your streaming data going into something else in real time. And along those lines, how many queries 
users or customers can access or be consulting the graph at any given time. This is a really important one, again, if you're using streaming, but also if you are using this graph on the back end of your search, you really need to understand how many people can be in and around and how many queries can this thing handle all at one time. This probably goes back into some of the latency questions, but it's something you need to consider if you are doing streaming or if you are constantly consulting the graph for some reason. Something that you're going to definitely need uh, to do if you are licensing anything is what kind of security measures do you know? Do they follow? You know the ISOs of security. Um, do they follow specific standards? If you are interested in certain standards, whether it's security or data governance or or something of that nature, you really want to understand what rules of engagement this graph is going to be following, or that you can maybe ask them to follow so that you can become a customer of theirs. If it's an external graph that you're licensing, and if it's even internally, sometimes the folks that are building these graphs they don't know what your use case is. So if you're the finance department and you're trying to use this graph, maybe you need to have certain things in place that the original builders of the graph were not aware of. So you need to make sure that you cover those bases. And along with that, there's versioning, right? So you would think that this is a data set, it's going to have version control. Mm, doesn't always work that way, so make sure you ask. So some of the things you have to think about with this are, are there rollback procedures? Maybe um, a, a bug was introduced with the last version, or maybe you know there was something really bad about the data that you need to you know roll back and correct. That is something that you need to understand as well as are they going to honor the changes like we said in a previous point uh, that you have done and how does the versioning interact with the changes that you've done. If you're adding your own data sources in and you have your own versioning going on, how do these version controls uh, marry together? These are some things that can get pretty tricky pretty fast because a graph is an interweaving, right? So, you know, if one little thing change, it kind of ripples through or can ripple through things. So you really want to make sure you understand how all the versioning control works. And along with that is uh, backwards compatibility as well is, you know, if you're unable to update to their newer version, how many previous versions are they willing to support while you, and this is really important if you have a small team or you have no team and you use contractors or something, you need to be able to understand like what <laughs> update uh, window you have to get up to speed to the new one and what do they honor with that as well. And another one that I think it often gets overlooked is how does the graph handle sensitive data? Now this can be considered in two different ways. So some sensitive data would be things that are legally considered sensitive. So that would be like social uh, security numbers or self-identification kind of things, things that would be covered by like HIPAA and you know legal law abiding things that you are not allowed to just share with everybody. So you really need to understand how the graph will um, adhere to those. And it kind of goes back to one of the points earlier about you know the different standards that it follows. It's compliant in certain uh, uh, regulations, that sort of thing. But there's another category here that I don't hear often talked about, and that is sensitive as in it could be damaging, harmful, or upsetting to, to some folks. Um, for instance, it, there, there was a, an example, I think, a few years ago where there was a colonel, I think, in the U.S. Army, um, and they, dis they changed their gender, and in the data, it was still representing this individual as, as male when now they were female. So that is damaging because now, you know, there's, there's a lot of complications to that. So you really need to understand how the graph will identify, help you identify, maybe support your sensitivity uh, lists that you might have. Um, this could even go into things like, um, you know, foul language or go into disputed things. So maybe some research says, um, you know, vitamin C causes cancer and some says it, it cures cancer. You know, that's a debate. So anything that would be considered debate, those are types of things that you need to understand how this graph will handle them itself. You probably want some basic mechanisms in place on the graph itself. Um, a lot of this will also change by culture and geographic region. So there are certain geographic regions that will describe, is it the Sea of Japan or is it the Korean Sea? I don't know, depends on where you live, uh, what you are describing that body of water as. So this is something that you wanna make sure when you're looking at a knowledge graph that you yourself are, are not developing 
Um, they need to have something in place for you to either give them what you are requiring or that they have some foundational things that you can take into consideration as well. All right, so now let's jump into graph composition questions. So the first one is usually what schema or, or what namespace or, you know, what are those types of things that are being used in the graph? So this could be um, the graph is in JSON or JSON-LD or it can handle DITA or, you know, it's using SCOS and Dublin Core or schema.org, you know, like all of those kinds of things. You really just want to understand um, if you're using this, can you use it as it is, or are you going to have to do some kind of transformation to use it in whatever downstream systems that you have? And if you have your own data set, do, are they compatible? What data is it created from? Is it licensed data? Is it web scrape data? Is it human generated, um, manually curated kind of data? Understanding um, and what, what ratio of all of those are, um, what, is in the graph because that helps you understand some of the other questions on um, whether you have good coverage or um, how trustworthy the data can be and you know some of those other questions. And speaking of, what are the prominent data sources within the graph? So this is an easy way to market internally or if you're you know looking at graphs on, on the web that are for hire, um, what are some of the, the really prominent data sources that you yourself know exist for your domain or your use case or your business that you would kind of say, oh, check mark, cool, they have that one. And to what degree? Always ask what percentage of that data set is uh, in their graph because sometimes they can say, oh yeah, we, we, have, we have that one in there. And it's like two entities, <laughs> that's it. There's nothing else in there. Uh, so really understanding if, uh, this is a good way to understand, understand if they understand your domain, your use case, your business to some extent because they knew how important that data set was and it is included and that they have made the effort of translating as much of it in as possible. And I've heard, I've said domain uh, business uh, a few times here and this is your, the domain uh, that you work in. So what domains does it cover? Uh, so if they don't cover, let's say, scholarly materials or creative works, if you're going with schema.org, uh, and that's your main use case, it's not going to be a good graph for you because they don't actually have a lot of coverage there. Um, this goes for any domain. And, you know, obviously, if you yourself are the one developing the graph, you're going to have to come up with what domains uh, you're going to list, but also kind of have a back uh, on the back end how to translate your domains to whatever domains your customer would come in and, and describe to you. So um, a good example of this is if somebody comes in and says, yes, we cover the information domain. Okay, that's a whole graph. So how do you <laughs> how do you pick that apart and tell them what coverage your graph has for whatever uh, domain they are interested in? And uh, what is the saturation of that domain? And domains can, can cross-pollinate, right? Like, uh, sports medicine is both sports and medicine, right? So, so some of them will cross pollinate. So you really need to understand how these things are being counted up and uh, the, what the ratios are in the graph so that you can make a determination whether this is going to be useful for you or if it's great clay on the table and then you have to supplement. Next one is super, 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 super critical if you're doing anything with LLMs or machine learning in general. And that is, what is the confidence score on this thing? What is the trustworthiness score on this thing? I've, I've heard some folks say, oh, well, we use a lot of licensed data, uh, so therefore it's really trustworthy. Or, oh, this graph just uses only online data, um, linked open data sources, so it's not as trustworthy. Those are blanket statements, don't buy them. Uh, I have worked with many, many, many licensed data sets in my day, and I will tell you they have errors, they have problems, they can be outdated. Che you need to check the trustworthiness or the confidence score that this thing is true. Uh, for anything you're using the graph for. And so, um, and on the other side, linked data sources, they sometimes are even more reliable in, in some cases uh, than even the licensed data because they have active communities looking at it that have like a real passion for having this thing up to date and as trustworthy as it can be. If you are looking at linked open data sources, some of them, uh, like Music Brains is a good example, they actually tell you on their stat uh, statistics page, how uh, confident or what is the um, quality of their data. Again, you wanna like unpack 
that a little bit and make sure you understand how they're defining that, how they're assessing it. Uh, but this is something you really, really want to ask. And if they don't have this, you definitely want to push them on it. Along those same lines, you really want to understand how often uh, they run the quality measures on their graph. And I say this because at one point in time, something can be accurate. Uh, for instance, who is on any given baseball team, but then it changes over time. So anything that has um, time criticality, so a lot of news topics, um, you know, things that are going on uh, with conflicts around the world, these things are constantly changing very, very rapidly. So you wanna make sure that you understand, one, how they ingest time series data, and then second, how, how they assess the quality or accuracy of these newer statements. And in a general, how often do they look at the complete accuracy of their graph and what does that update schedule look like? Because that's all gonna be very important to you if you are using the graph for, again, LLMs, which really need that because they're not very good with time series data uh, or time critical data, things that are rapidly happening and changing after they were trained. Um, that's a big reason you use a knowledge graph with LLM. So this is a really important one to keep in mind. Another that I think is kind of overlooked depending on your use case, maybe you don't care about other languages. I always care about other languages. So really looking at how many languages does it cover? What is this, the coverage of those languages for any given node or edge? So entity or relation. Um, if it was done by machines or humans or kind of a mix, you really need to understand some of the things. And if it is tr um, translated either by humans or machines, that should be part of the provenance data, which is another thing you should probably look at is, do they have provenance data? Where did this data come from? That's really important for you, especially if you're doing any kind of machine learning or analytics off of this, because if you're able to kind of backtrack where this stuff came from, that's a good leg up in um, understanding whether this thing can be um, considered high quality or trustworthy. Again, it's not the end, it's just the beginning of assessing that, which is, did it come from a trustworthy source? Maybe, maybe not. Um, even if it comes from a trustworthy source, like I said before, gotta verify that. Um, but anyways, this is something to, to consider if you're if you're getting into that space. All right, now into more of the statistics piece of the composition, which is how many entities or nodes, how many relations or edges, how many uh, statements. So that would be the the triple itself. How many of those are unique or proprietary? So this kind of gives you a feel for if you go with one knowledge graph over another, maybe it's because one is more complete according to you know what's just known out there on the world, like from a Wikidata or a linked open data perspective, or are you really interested in stuff that's not so easily mined from the web? If that is your use case, you know maybe that means the graph has more licensed data, or maybe they have uh, real people going out and you know doing questionnaires and like creating data sets. That's something they really need to understand for whichever use case you have. And how many data sources do they have? Uh, if they do not disclose that, um, especially with those that are for hire, they sometimes don't give you all of them, because explicitly telling you which data sources. And that's often because they don't want you to be able to recreate the graph yourself. Um, and it, obviously they have other controls and other value adds that they add in, but that's generally why they might not give you the full list. So if they don't give you the full list, make sure you ask how many data sources, how often they're updated, which domains they're from, language coverage, you know, all of these other statistical um, things that we've gone over. But also going back to some of the things uh, I said earlier, you know, if you have a list of data sources that you really want to check that are um, contained in this graph and it's not on the list that they provide or they're not willing to um, disclose that on, you know, some page, ask, right? Usually they're willing to tell you, yes, we have that one. Yes, we have that one. Yes, it's to this much coverage um, without giving away the store. So just be aware, like sometimes you can't always get the full list. The other one um, that is important is how many links into the graph, so that would be how many other uh, linked data sets they are linking in, and that's kind of like the coverage of some data sources, and how many uh, links are linking out, meaning 
if this is a data source uh, that is open, how many other data sources are, are using it. The reason both of these are important is one, it kind of gives you a composition of the different data sources that are being used, but also it makes the graph more sticky. Meaning if there's a whole lot of links in and a whole lot of links out, it means a lot of people are depending on that data source. So a lot of people are using that, that data source, meaning the knowledge graph. Um, and so therefore it means that it will likely stick around for a while, which if you're an organization and you're looking for a graph for hire, that's probably good because you don't want to build stuff on a graph that is going to disappear. So you don't want that. So this is a good uh, data point to, to find out like the, what's the staying power of, of this graph. Another is um, what other linked assets does it contain? So these would be images or videos or documents or maybe even 3D renders, things that um, would associate and be additional uh, compositions or um, you know, like uh, knowledge panels, like if they include some knowledge panels, what's the coverage of that across the graph? And again, per, per domain, if that is of interest for you. And make sure they have the right licensing for those, right? I've worked with some graphs for hire that were like, yeah, yeah it's on Wikidata. It, okay, well, do you <laughs> did you verify that you can use that image and therefore I can use that image? So make sure you really understand, you know, the access rights and all of that uh, is, is thoroughly investigated before you sign on to something like this. And then the last thing in this category is, is this just one giant graph? Does it have subgraphs and, can you use um, your own, can you create your own subgraphs or uh, graph embeddings from this graph? Because um, oftentimes you don't need this entire graph. Uh, for your specific use case, maybe you just need a subset of the graph and that would make your latency better. It would make your cost hopefully better, um, depending on how these um, graph for hires are charging you. But this is something to, to consider because um, you don't always need the whole graph and you also want to make sure if you need more nodes, more edges and more things added into the graph, um, into your subset of the graph, you can do that um, and understand that there's, you know, some, some kind of process to do that with the, the vendor uh, or the organization or the, the um, group that you're working with internally. So the last is use case questions, which is which domains uh, and which use cases are using this the most? and understanding if that aligns with something you're already doing, it kind of gives you a clue as to whether, you know, if you need more professional services, if they offer that, um, with the folks that own the knowledge graph, um, if they have experience doing whatever your use case is and therefore they can help you a little bit more with it. And that also goes into, you know, does the graph support graph analytics? Does it support graph ML? So, you know, we were talking about access to the graph. Sometimes it's just a you know, you get a, um, a node and an edge back or an entity and the statement of an entity, for instance, Barack Obama's birth date, or can you actually send in GraphML queries? So you can start to do, you know, network analysis and, you know, shortest path between two different things for, you know, product recommendations and link predictions and those types of things. If that's part of your use case, you need to make sure that their APIs can handle it. And then, you know, new to the game is, do they have augmented querying? So that is usually powered by some LLM somewhere, and that is helping your users generate queries across your graph. And again, making sure that that makes sense for your use case. Another one that's kind of emerging, um, it's been around for a little bit of time, but um, I find it, it's, it's showing up a lot more because the LLM space, which is, can it take structured and unstructured data and mine uh, new entities, new relations, and new statements from those data sources? And can it dedupe and um, do entity resolution? Because oftentimes you're gonna get the same person over and over again, just with different spellings or different combinations of their names. You wanna make sure that their graph is deduping all of those things. And can it do fact verification? I kind of mentioned earlier, you wanna make sure that they have some kind of um, metric on this, like, you know, this is the high quality that we have, here's the confidence we have, but how are they verifying the facts? Making sure that you really understand how they do that and 
what their service looks like for that, if it's a service you can use or if it's just, you know, uh, how the sausage is made for the graph. Another that is kind of emerging again because the LLM space is uh, human annotation. So can uh, humans do the verification? Can humans interact with the graph and update it as necessary and not as a graph expert, but more as an annotator? So, um, you know, can it support internal annotators going in and doing things um, kind of like a survey, right? Like you send the survey out, they kind of say yes, no, maybe so, um, and, and things get adjusted. Or can you connect something in like a mechanical Turk where you um, are soliciting or, or sending out as invitation for annotators to come in and help you maintain and update and verify your graph. That's something you really wanna see if that is a capability yet or not. Uh, along the lines of data ingestion, like where the sausage is made uh, for the graph, um, depends on your use case, but you might wanna ask like what kind of transformations were done and if they have documentation on that because oftentimes maybe they were you know ingesting a certain data set, but you maybe ingested it a different way on your instance and the values are not adding up, right? So that's, that's something that isn't, I think, as imperative unless that's your use case. Um, but it's something that I've seen enough that um, people are like, why do I get different, you know, entities or edges or whatever um, from these data sources. This is why the transformation, there's something going on in there that needs to be documented. And the last two are, are they fair? video up above on what fair means. Um, but it's, you know, is it transparent? Is it repeatable? Is it information that has provenance? This is very important, especially in the LLM space again, because you need to backtrack and figure out where things came from if you can. Um, this is really helpful for any machine learning, by the way. Uh, why did I get the answer that I did? I don't know, let me go find out. Um, why was this, uh, when was the last time this entity or this relation was updated? Uh, what's the last time the fact verification uh, or confidence measure was run on this? When was the last time um, this was human verified, right? Like there's all these things that having the provenance and where did it come from and how many other data sources does it come from? These are all good data points to have and it's called provenance. Making sure that whatever was done can be repeated and you really understand where it's coming from, that transparency. And the last, but certainly not least, is what success or KPI metrics have others used to show the value of this knowledge graph? So great, you go through all these different things. You're like, this is lovely, I love it. It's gonna be great for my use case. How do you make sure you have the data to back that up? Because you're gonna pay for this, whether it's internal or external, there's some kind of cost, right? You need to be able to say, and like, hey, this thing helped us decrease our error rate, or it sped up our process by this, or it decreased the amount of time we had to maintain X, or it increased our machine learning or LLM by Y. These are things you need to have because then your stakeholders are gonna be like, great, so that check we wrote, it was worth it. <laughs> so don't forget that, that's pretty important. Um, and another way to even look at it is, um, you know, is the graph as a service even helping you? So what's the precision and the recall on this thing? Um, and how well did you do the entity resolution? And is the confidence score actually um, what you need it for your use case? All of those things are measures that you have to keep in mind. Hopefully the KM that you have um, that you're working with or that your licensing is going to have a dashboard or some kind of reporting for you to constantly be maintaining this and making sure that you're all on the same page as far as how successful it is. All right, I know that was a lot. I really hope this has been helpful. I'm sure there's a few that I've been missing, but I try to be pretty thorough with this one. Uh, so if you have any tips on how you assess a knowledge graph, or if you have others that I did not mention earlier on that are graphs for hire, I'm sure there's a lot of them out there. I just put up the ones that I know of. Um, these, I think this is gonna be the, here you go, predictions for 2024 and beyond. Uh, graph as a service, uh, graphs for hire, I think it's gonna become a, kind of a cottage industry. That's, that's, that's my hot take on it. Um, so hopefully this video helps you when you get to that point and you need to assess a graph and to find out whether it's right for you. All right, so I wanna thank you very much and I'll catch you next time.